Hi there. Welcome to the EPRC podcast. Uh, we are so excited to be here with the incredibly talented and lovely Dr. Martin Hecker. Um, he's an associate professor and research director in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the University of Louisville. He's also the co-editor-in-chief of the free open access journal of Wellness, which is amazing, and a member of the Emergent Phenomenology Research Consortium, the EPRC. So thank you so much for being here, Martin. It's uh, it's just wonderful having you as a member and just so interested in your research and work. Uh, and I was just wondering to start, do you want to tell us a little bit about your background and he, how you got into the field of emergency medicine? Sure. Yeah. So thank you for having me. This is great. Um, <laughs> so I'm born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, started to think about engineering, ended up choosing medicine. Um, during med school, I got in with an ophthalmology uh, doctor who kind of became my mentor and initially matched in ophthalmology, eye surgery. Um, but then during my intern year after school, I started loving working in the ICU and just randomly was in the ER for eight shifts that year, uh, all in one month or in a two week span and just fell in love with emergency medicine. And so I gave up my spot in eye surgery and uh, six months later or so um, switched into the ER residency and uh, finished training actually a little more than 10 years ago now. Oh, that's incredible. So much work goes into it. Um, what do you think you drew you to it the most? Is it like the energy of it or what do you think really brought you to it? I think looking back now and knowing myself better in 10 years, probably the breadth of the medicine um, because mm -hmm. I had chosen ophthalmology because it was challenging and, uh, you know, you do surgery and, and all of that was very cool, but it was so focused on just the eyeball and you can even do subspecialties within ophthalmology. So I think EM appealed to me because it literally any, I could open any journal, any textbook, any, you know, news story about medicine and it would be relevant for me. So I, I think the, my intellectual curiosity, just loving to learn about everything about the whole world um, in EM, I can learn anything in medicine and it relates to my job. Oh, that's a, yeah, that is so perfect. I, I think uh, last time we talked, I had mentioned that's exactly what it felt like with my PhD, where everything had to be so narrow. You'd have this like very narrow topic, like romantic era literature with Mary Shelley's short stories or something. Yeah. And and I loved that research, but when I got excited was when you got to get into the interdisciplinary part of it and looking yes. at how it relates to, yeah, um, medicine and, and science and um, psychology and all of that. And that's really, everything is so interesting connected. So yeah, that makes sense, eh? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And also that makes me think of, yeah, like the EPRC itself and how it's this like group of multidisciplinary researchers and how key that is. Um, I might have mentioned uh, EPRC member Brie Benjamin last time. She has the Vermont Center for Integrative uh, Health. And that also makes me think of, yeah, again, just these um, interdisciplinary approaches to healing and mental health, um, which is so important. Um, so is that sort of how you approach healthcare itself too? So you have these broad interests, um, but do you kind of approach it from interdisciplinary perspectives as well? I would say certainly in emergency medicine, you know, for the first 10 years, I try to, because, you know, you get focused on the one problem, the patient comes in with this symptom, um, but you can't ignore all the other organ systems or what's going on in their life and, and all the things that led up to this point. But then what I've been practicing is we call it lifestyle medicine or integrative medicine um, for a year and a half now. And, and in that respect, completely, we, we have a comprehensive integrative approach where, you know, what you eat affects your mood and affects your relationships. And so, um, you know, this Western idea of splitting everything into these silos, is, it's just not how the human body and, and how our lives work. Um, yeah. I try to bring it back to emergency medicine as well. And of course, in, in the lifestyle medicine too. Yeah, so true. So true. Yeah, just the the microbiome too. That idea that yeah, like the gut is like a little brain or something, right? And how connected all of those things are, and what you eat to how stressed you are, and to depression, and yeah, it's so so interesting. And are you also you've done work? I know, like the Journal of Wellness. Um, there there have been articles on meditation for um, emergency medicine students. Is that something you look into as well? Sure. I mean, so I, I first learned about it through a, a short course, kind of like a mindfulness-based stress reduction sort of course at UofL with some faculty members. And then we, you know, like students came into those courses, residents sometimes. We've accepted papers from various other universities doing the same kind of thing. I mean, it's just 
it's one of the, it's almost become cliche like yoga and meditation. That's how you cure burnout. And so yeah. there, there is that part of it where it needs to be part of a, again, integrative or more comprehensive approach to uh, help your healthcare workers and students thrive. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that's hit medicine uh, you know, yeah. all over the place. Yeah. So do you have a practice yourself? Like, do you meditate yourself? I don't do it enough. I, I tell my <laughs> patients the quote all the time that if everyone should meditate 10 minutes a day, and if you don't have 10 minutes, then you need 20. Uh, <laughs> yes. I don't know where I <laughs> yes. first saw that, but so I'm that kind of person, I think now, and, and yeah. not taking my own advice. Um, but I, you know, I, I do honestly, like I get, I feel like I'd kind of do more meditative approach to some activities like you know, jogging or walking or um, sitting out in nature and stop in the middle of the trail run and just look around and take it all in, um, you know, little plateau experiences like that. So, but it's, but my, you know, my actual like meditate, you know, like 10 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day, like sitting in a room being real disciplined about it. I've been slacking mm -hmm. lately for sure. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard when uh, you're in the line of work you're in too. But I think I love that what you said too, though, about just being able to bring the idea of like uh, meditation into everyday life where, yeah, you're noting things and paying attention, just the idea of, of attention and be able to like focus in and yeah, just not get caught up in all the thoughts and craziness of the day. So I think that's, that's so perfect. I, uh, yeah, I'm similar to you with meditation trying to uh, get better, but I recently had, um, I don't know if you've met Ruben Weiss yet, but he's one of the board members for Emergence Benefactors, which is the charity that supports the research of the EPRC. Uh, so he recently came and did a meditation with my uh, romantic poetry class um, and talked about it, yeah, in relation to like revolution and perception and how, yeah, it allows us to shift our thinking. And it was really interesting. So I, yeah, I remember reading articles through your journal of wellness on uh, meditation practice for uh, specifically medicine students, but yeah, just in general, it's such a, such an amazing practice. Um, and also wanted to ask you as well, talking about meditation, which is such an important um, subject of the EPRC research um, is sort of how, how do you, how did you get involved in the EPRC and, and how do you think your work aligns, that sort of thing? So getting involved um, all is through Dan Ingram. So he was a graduate of our program um, <laughs> and I had only heard legendary stories about him. Uh, never, I had not <laughs> met him. In fact, didn't meet him in person until just a few months ago. We had done oh, all nice. this over Zoom and, and everything. But so he trained in our program. He, I think, reached out to Dan Danzel, who was our chair for many years. And uh, but he was the chair when both of us went through training. And so he just reached out, explained all this to me, and he was so passionate about it. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm kind of a research guy and I'm into this stuff anyway. So, yeah, let's let's see what we can do. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I love the the connections and collaborative aspect of it too. It's uh, yeah, it's a really like exciting group of people and yeah, Daniel's been doing such great work. I love that he's like the, a retired emergency physician but also the meditation side of it too. So we're talking about like interdisciplinarity and including everything. I think he's such a great example of that. So, and how, what have you found? Have you found it um useful being part of the EPRC, um connecting with other researchers, that sort of thing? Yeah, we started out, yeah. uh, you know, with a with a project that's still ongoing, but trying to, I think the reason he approached me is that he believes probably a lot of patient, people have emergence and, and other phenomenon and don't yeah. know what to do with it. And they might even end up in an ER or especially an emergency psychiatry sort of unit. Exactly. And so he's like, maybe we should, we need to try to catch these people and give them better care potentially and, and even go all the way up to the textbook level where we even teach and train emergency medicine doctors to know what to do, you know, how to manage these people. No one really knows exactly how to, to help you out when, when something like that happens. Uh, so that was his initial approach. We've done some interviews, just kind of qualitative study um, on people's experience with treating patients who may or may not have emergence that, you know, as their complaint that brought them in. And so that's been really cool. That's been my main wow. contribution so far is, is working yeah. on that study, but of course, open to, to other things in the future.
That's so important too. It's such a, yeah, such a worry when people are having um, emergent experiences. So um, different effects that can arise from emergent practices such as meditation or the use of psychedelics, ecstatic dance, um, yoga. So all of these emergent practices that could potentially bring about emergent experiences and the idea that they're often confused with yeah, mental health issues when in fact there are much easier ways to, to help these people. So I think it's amazing that, um, yeah, that you have that knowledge and there's going to be that extra support in the system. Um, and also speaking of the, the healthcare system, uh, what do you think, do you think that there's sort of the major problem facing emergency medicine today? Um, is there something you think you can pinpoint? Yeah, so for, um, there is something specific for emergency medicine. I do think with medicine in general, yeah. this, this whole laser focus and subspecializing and, and really focus on sickness instead of on wellness and well-being is something that plagues our approach to medicine uh, in the West. But, but then for emergency medicine, medicine in particular, we have had a few reports lately on workforce issues. Uh, so that's something students are coming through. We're, we're actually seeing less students apply to emergency medicine. We, uh, you know, residents are a little worried. Am I going to be able to get a job afterwards? And so we're, we're almost seeing students who really are passionate about the specialty and aren't at, you know aren't choosing their specialty just based on finances or what kind of job prospects they will have when they graduate. Um, but it, it's definitely a concern that we may have an oversupply of ER docs in 2030, whereas you know in many decades past we were always undersupplied. Uh, and oh, so that's okay. that's what something a lot of people are talking about now. We wrote a paper um, to try to look at that as a positive. You know, the obstacle is the way sort of thing. Um, on the scope of emergency medicine and how if some of these challenges are occurring with the workforce, then maybe, uh, you know, let's expand our scope. Let's get into wellness medicine, administration, teaching, research, uh, all these different, uh, you know, pathways we can go to expand with our great skill set. And so, uh, you know, but that that's kind of what the buzz is about lately in yeah. emergency medicine circles. Yeah. That's such a perfect way to go about it too. There's all this work on um, like the power of uncertainty and in this like current moment, the neuroscience of it, how everything's up in the air and we need to find a way, a new way to approach things. So instead of just being in this state of fear and being paralyzed, instead embracing the uncertainty and embracing doubt and finding a new way to do things. So I think that's so perfect. You're kind of choosing as an opportunity to, to rethink the whole system and how it can be improved. So that's, yeah, that's amazing. I'm really astounded by the work you do. And uh, it's just, yeah, such a pleasure to have you as part of the EPRC as well. Um, I also am really curious about, um, given your work, it's just you must meet so many people on a daily basis and whether there's an instance that, that really touched you or that transformed your life or shifted your perspective in some way um, in like an interaction with a patient, for example. Um, one good example, so I, we treat a lot of patients with substance use, and that's a big focus of a lot of my research. And we I interact with patients in the ER. They're, you know, this is their worst day. Often they have just overdosed, may have been resuscitated, revived uh, from near death. And it's hard to really make a big connection with a patient, um, you know, find hope and what, what, how they can come out on the other side of such a thing. But recently we did a, a research study with patients at a, a rehab center in Louisville. Um, and they, it's a really great place where they will drive a van to your house and pick you up and make you come in to get to the, to the group therapy. And so we did some focus groups on wellness in, you know, managing substance use disorder rather than saying like, you know, stay clean, don't do the drugs, like, focus on the sickness part. We, we asked a lot of questions about what makes you happy, where, you know, where are you thriving in the physical realm and the mental realm? How are your relationships? I talked about finances. And so it was, it was really eye opening to me to be able to have that connection with patient, you know, potential patients of mine who, um, outside of the hospital, outside of the ER and sit down in a room and just discuss these regular life issues that we all face. And, to see how much they're going through, how, how just supremely hard it is for them to just pay the monthly electric bill, make, you know, transportation to get, you know, their therapy at, at the rehab facility or to get their buprenorphine uh, for medication assisted treatment. And so that has just helped increase the compassion we already try to maintain um, when we're working with patients in the ER at their lowest point. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's, yeah, the community of it is so important. It's often um, so isolating, um, that addiction. And so the fact that you're able to bring people together and they're able to tell their stories, that really makes me think too of the value of like the medical humanities and yeah, and telling your story and sharing it and how that sort of empathetic sharing between like patient and doctor can be so transformative for, yeah, for both. Um, do you think um, there is like value? And we've talked about this before. I'd love to do more work on it, but just the value of the humanities um, and and medicine sort of intermingling. Oh, I, I'm all about it. It's it's yeah. one of, probably my favorite or top two uh, research projects we're doing now is on medical humanities, which we've shared some materials about. We, we have picked up some steam on it with a couple of great mm -hmm. medical students and two of my residents and we're coding a little over a thousand articles that are essays written in EM journals because a lot of we publish a lot of science it's you know x number of patients here's the treatment intervention does it work but with this project we're focusing on the essays that that doctors write and submit and you'll see them in most medical journals and we picked our four EM journals that seem to publish the most of those and just coding them for themes positive, negative, talking about death, life, hope, uh, burnout. Um, and so, you know, are they dialogues? Are they stories? Are they a straight dry essay kind of thing? And so we are working really hard to code all that and try to, you know, present like, what are the stories we tell to ourselves amongst ourselves in medicine and emergency medicine? And, you know, are they uplifting? What direction are they going? Um, and so, uh, we're really pumped about that. We just, our abstract was accepted to uh, one of our national conferences that's in May. Um, so mm -hmm. we will be able to present uh, our data there, uh, you know, on, on what we're finding out with this one. I also was curious, um, slightly off topic, but related to the EPRC, whether you've had your own emergent experiences um, yourself or spiritual experiences, or whether that's something you're more interested in from a sort of medical perspective. I mean, a little of both. I, I, Mm -hmm. I've always been religious and spiritual to some degree, a Catholic, yeah. um, didn't really do all of the initiation uh, rituals for Catholicism until like eighth grade. So I was a little older, I guess I understood it. Um, I wasn't yeah. just taking communion as a second grader, not really knowing what was going on. And so um, I've, I've always just felt like there was something else. I would say, if anything, I'm a supernaturalist. Like, I think that the materialist, uh, you know, uh, way to look at the world and, and thinking anyone who thinks there's something beyond the atoms and, and energy in the universe yeah. that I think they're missing out on something. So, you know, I, I've always felt like felt it intuitively that something like that's going on. And I've had many experiences over the years. I don't know how they were earth shattering, but just I'd call it maybe more plateau experiences. Just, yeah. you know, I, I can remember one time running in the rain. I had like a injured ankle, uh, went to Florida with a friend and just like disappeared and ran in the rain and ankle stopped hurting and just kind of like a spiritual experience. Um, and so I, I've just felt like we can all sort of channel into whatever that is, that oneness um, and feel that compassion and love for everyone. And so um, I've been lucky enough to have that happen to me several times, you know, throughout life without any like dedicated 10 day silent retreat, uh, intense approach to it. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's it's so interesting experiences. Like lots of people mention running um, and being out in nature, how that brings them about as well. Um, and but yeah, and also like community. So you were mentioning the the group that you're working with, um, and and how working with people who are experiencing similar addictions, um, you sort of um, connect together just even on a physical level and like change your own brain behaviors as you're sharing these stories. And but also speaking about addiction, I know that that is one of um, the focus of your work. And I was wondering um, if that sort of you're doing work too on the current opioid epidemic as well, right? Um, and just wondering um, why sort of how you think that we can address that as well. What's sort of some of the most important tools to address that at this moment? Yeah, I think it, it's tough. I mean, we know certain things scientifically, like based on the evidence that do work. One of those is using medications like buprenorphine, you know, yeah. treating opioid use disorder as a, as a medical problem. Um, you know, just like diabetes, you would offer the medication that works the best for a diabetic patient and hope that, you know, and, and help them follow up and maybe they slip up and their diet is not optimal and they forget to take their medicine, but we don't judge them and harshly and say, you did this to yourself and, mm -hmm. you know, get out of my ER. And so 
approaching this, you know, I, I, there are a lot of people now talking about addiction, uh, the disease model of addiction and sort of pushing back against that, which I like philosophically, mm -hmm. that idea, you know, maybe calling it more of a learning disorder. There are a bunch of authors mm -hmm. throwing these terms around, but I, I don't like to say, well, now you have a disease and you know, we'll have this for the rest of your life and we'll use yeah. pills to fix it. Um, I think there's a role for using medication to help, but I'd rather think of it as something you could overcome that you could, you know, totally cure or at least go in remission. Um, so yeah. I, I think that medication treatment is, is an important part of it. Multidisciplinary approaches with social workers, psychologists, compassionate doctors, uh, you know, psychiatrists, everybody uh, working together as a team. Um, trying to get the supply off the streets. A lot of the legislation, you know, is trying to limit prescribing of pills. Of course, trying to limit, you know, how much heroin and fentanyl make it into uh, the, the supply system as well. And and those are all battles being fought, you know, well outside of my realm of medicine and in the ER. But so those are some of the approaches that hopefully all kind of coalesce into, you know, reduced deaths and, and improved quality yeah, of lives for people. And do you think um, like emergent practices have a role to play in it as well? So like, like yoga and meditation or breath work, I know that, are, you know, that's not a substitute for the medication that can be necessary, but do you think that those, those practices would be useful for people um, suffering from addiction? Oh, totally. I mean, if you go back to yeah. William James, Carl Jung, you know, Bill Wilson, who founded AA, um, many people yeah. believe back then like to find true uh, you know, remission of alcoholism or to, to really fit, you know, cure your addiction, our spiritual experience was almost required. I think that's kind of what William James believed or, or saw that the people who were most successful had something like that happen. So I think, it, you know, again, like Gabor Mate says that, you know, people with addiction basically always working on pain. Like I don't ask, you know, you know, why they're addicted, I ask why the pain, I think is something he says. Exactly. And so, you know, things like yoga and, and emergent things that can lead to emergent phenomena and, and practices like meditation and, and just social connection with the opioid receptors that get activated when we connect yeah. socially. Um, that is, those are all ways for us to cope with pain. That's part of being a human. And so if you learn these healthier techniques to cope with pain, maybe you don't turn to drugs in your teen years and and maybe it's a way to, you know, move away from drug use, even in adult years, toward one of these healthier, you know, forms of coping with yeah. pain. So beautifully said and so true. Yeah, it makes me think of Russell Brand, too. And, and yeah, just this idea of the addiction being caused by some some need for something or some like longing for connection and how spirituality is connection and, and how that is such a, a powerful, powerful to transformative tool um, in response to that. So yeah. Um, thank you for sharing that too, um, Martin. Like it's, it's, I don't know. I, I'm really amazed by um, your different, like you do have such a, I'm trying, trying to think of the word, like a kind, calming presence. And I, I think that what you're doing um, and with the different approaches to it, you're just helping so many people. So it's, uh, yeah, it's just amazing getting to talk to you. Um, another thing that comes to mind as you're speaking so eloquently um, is you wrote a piece called uh, Stoicism Defeats Burnout. Um, and I was wondering if you could say more about that, because I, I think it's really such an interesting title. I got to read it myself, but I would, I would love to hear your thoughts on that, because I think that'd be really interesting to people listening. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's one of my favorite things I've written. Stoicism has become popular, almost popularized. Um, and so, uh, but but it, it was neat. I was just looking at the, the three categories of burnout, which are emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and lack of <laughs> professional fulfillment. And so those those are your score, your burnout score. If, if you score highly, um, then you're burned out. And so I was reading about stoicism and you know, various original sources and a lot of the new stuff written about it, uh, people like Ryan Holiday and William Irvine. Um, and, and I'm like, wait a minute, the, the these core virtues of stoicism are exact treatments for these three categories of burnout. Um, you know, that, has anyone ever written about this before? And there really was almost nothing in, in medical literature about stoicism, period. Um, since then, I've seen a few more things, even Journal of Wellness, we published uh, an article um, that talked a lot about stoicism uh, by another author. So yeah, I was like, oh shoot, I just, I want to write about this. This is, this is pretty cool. And, and I've gotten a few compliments on it and uh, yeah, it's been a fun one. 
Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, you're such a good writer too. That's what I meant to mention. And then speaking of, of writing, you have like read behind you. And I, I know those are some of your favorite books. So I just wanted to mention last time um, we talked, we talked about this amazing book. If uh, people haven't read it, When Breath Becomes Air, um, just a, a beautiful, heartbreaking book about being diagnosed with cancer and and um, talking about knowing that as he was still a, um, in medicine and how he found that it was the connection between between literature and reading and medicine that really brought him joy and was so important. Um, so that was one book that we talked about, but I would love to know back there. Do you have a, do you have a favorite one back there of, of your favorites? <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah. Well, Paul Kalanithi, that, is that the one you held up yeah. earlier? Oh yeah, yeah exactly. I, yeah, no, I have read so, yeah. that and I've said to many that people, one. I probably will never read it again. It was just too yeah. heartbreaking, but you know, sometimes it's good to read heartbreaking things. Um, yeah. But and then the last chapter that his wife wrote was just beautiful as well. Yeah, um, so beautiful. I mean, along those lines of a recent book that did make it onto my shelf, you know, on that topic of kind of bittersweetness is the book Bittersweet, which I think okay. I sent an email to you maybe um, by Susan Kane, who wrote Quiet yeah. about introversion. Um, right. All that book I've, you know, given to a few people, um, read through it twice uh, watched her TED talk about it. Um, it kind of hits on a lot of these, ex you know, spiritual experiences we're talking about, like the longing, the thinking something else is out there, C.S. Lewis sort of ideas. Um, mm -hmm. And so I would, I would put bittersweet up there, um, very high on the list. Um, and then I have one right in front of me that on organization, this book, um, I'm going to, I'm going to write a book review about it, uh, building a second brain. I'm going to write a book review for our Louisville Medicine Journal, our local journal, uh, because it, it has changed my approach to organizing all this stuff I read and all the, you know, like, where did I read that? Nice. How can I find that? I want to share it with <laughs> somebody. Um, so that book is amazing. It's kind of, you know, one of those organization books that can be sort of dry and, you know, not, not a lot of heart to them, but this, this book's, um, I highly recommend it. Okay. Yeah. I'll recommend it to uh, listeners and people watching as well. That sounds amazing. The other one I wanted to mention we've talked about too, is that, um, Mere Touch, which is all about this neurologist who has synesthesia, um, and he has Mere Touch synesthesia, which will always blow my mind, meaning that he can literally feel the pain of other people. Um, so I was curious what you would, how would that, how you would sort of navigate that? Like if you were in emergency medicine, but you could like physically feel the pain of others, do you, how do you think that would, uh, how would that, how would that go for you? <laughs> yeah, so I haven't read that yet, and I, I'm excited to, I do have it yeah. on your recommendation, but oh gosh, I think that would be very tough to, mm -hmm. to do my job and really feel people's pain um you know you have to stay calm you have to mm -hmm. try to some degree to detach in the moment when you're managing a sick patient or talking to family um after the fact you can let that those emotions hit you and try to process through them but oh gosh i, I don't know if i could do my job if, if i were you know could could empathize so directly with what my patients are going through which is often horrible things yeah. And, and give it, you already are such an empathetic person. So do you already find that, um, a difficult thing to navigate with patients, just kind of empathizing too much almost? Yeah. I, I bounce back and forth. I mean, sometimes yeah. maybe I don't empathize enough, you know, I, like I kind of think, what do I feel about what happened? Did, you know, am I really letting myself feel how sad I should be after this thing that happened? And, and then, you know, just simply not getting, animated and activated by things going on at work because I have to stay calm and then coming home and someone falls down and is bleeding and has a cut. And my wife's like, you know what, you need to, you need to work, you know, get more worked up over these things. And I'm like, oh, that's just kind of at work. I can't, yeah, no matter how right. crazy it is, no matter what someone says, I have to just stay calm and, and even to keep the team together. And so, um, yeah, it would, you know, I, I, I want to, engage those emotions at work and, and empathize with patients. But at the same time, in the moment, it's, it's hard to be a really good doctor and do that. Yeah. It wouldn't be useful if like, if I were the doctor just crying alongside them, <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't, that wouldn't help them at all, would it? <laughs> oh yeah. And so, but sometimes but, there's a role for that. You know, my wife's an OBGYN yeah. and she talks about uh, sometimes, you know, at crying with a patient and, yeah. and there's many times where that's totally appropriate. It's just yeah. in, where I'm dealing with these, high stress, you know, moment to moment, things can change. And if you make the wrong decision, uh, bad things can happen. It's hard to feel it right in that moment, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, it's a 
incredibly trying but amazing job. Um, and yeah, what would you say, um, like finding moments of joy in your job, maybe to as one of the last questions, just to uh, end it off. And so yeah, what, what about your job? And if so, a for people wanting to get into emergency medicine, what is it that that you love about it? And yeah, where are your moments of joy? Uh, well, we the excitement part you, we kind of talked about earlier that yeah. did draw me to some degree. We're the most exciting fifteen minutes of every specialty, and so you know you get to see all that breadth. Yeah. Um, you get to see a lot of different things, and you know for people with a short attention span, if we have it all there for you. Um, for my job in particular, I do love the academic side. I, I love that I work in the ER. I, I have complex clinical patients and, and enjoy the stimulation, but then. Outside of that, I have relationships with residents and students and my partners, and, and we write papers together and, and do research. And so I, I don't know if I could have a great career longevity in emergency medicine if, if I didn't have that academic side to things. Right. So yeah. I highly recommend it. It doesn't mean you have to be a full-time faculty person. As long as you just get engaged with a teaching program around you, you can teach and you know have students come shadow you and uh, you know, give back to the community in that way. And so, you know, I think that those are huge sources of joy in my job and just building, trying to build connections with patients, however short lived, uh, you know, our time together. Yeah. Um, I think it's very beneficial to, you know, again, focus on the positive and not just on all the things that could be going wrong. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you are the person to have in the emergency room for sure. I would be happy to have you. Well, thank you very much for talking to us on the podcast. It's yeah, again, such a such a pleasure to have you as part of the EPRC and just to know you in general and one of my favorite people. Oh, oh, oh.